He is a graduate of Princeton University and started off his career at the Congressional Quarterly as a political editor. After that, he founded the National Journal and is currently a syndicated columnist on state and local government themes. He is here sharing his ideas today with many of you who are at the, the meeting and those of us here at the City Club on the National Civic Index, which identifies 10 factors that make a city work. His speech will share the progress that many cities have made in using this uh, index and other methods for uh, yes, assessing their infrastructure and um, improving their infrastructure. Will you help me welcome Mr. Neil Pierce. Thanks very much. I'm delighted to be here in one of my favorite of all America's cities. And I'm also very excited because I do have a little surprise for you. I am uh, able to make announcement and actually bring to you an important national award for the city of Portland just been made known within the last 24 hours in New York City. It is called the Rudy Brunner Award for Excellence in the Urban Environment. It is a project, this award, of the New York-based Brunner Foundation, which was set up a few years ago in honor of the late Rudy Brunner, who was a New York manufacturer who was committed to good design. What's interesting about the Rudy Brunner Award is that it is not just for some nice physical design, though. Not for something pretty. Not for a single building. It's actually not for a civic process, either. Rather, it is an award for both things that tries to show the intersection or the coming together uh, of local residents, city planners, architects, the broader community, in something which also has a physical manifestation. The Bernie Water, Bruner Award is now biennial. It was awarded for the first time in 1987 to a project many of you know, Seattle's Pike Place Market, a place of immense urban excitement and social significance because it keeps the producers and the urbanites, producers of food and the uh, city residents in direct person-to-person -person contact, has many social programs involved with it, it's a market that survived only because Seattleites cared enough to fight very hard against letting the business wise heads of the city turn it into a parking lot, which was the business agenda that year. And it's in a gritty inner city neighborhood that's worked very hard to minimize gentrification and keep a place for ordinary, in some cases, very poor Skid Row people. Maybe it says something that this year's Brunner Awards winners uh, are two one from the East Coast, and again one in the Pacific Northwest. I sat on the jury this year with such people as the mayors of Charleston, South Carolina, and Portland, Maine, the director of Chicago's Metropolitan Planning Council, the noted uh, landscape uh, designer and scholar, Ann Whiston Spurn, uh, Aaron Zaretsky, who's the executive director of the Pike Place Market Foundation, was invited to be on this year's jury. There were about 100 original applications. There were very tough choices to make from all over the United States. Uh, tough choices not just because of the project's excellence, but because of their immense span and the variety of problems that face American cities today. On the one hand, projects addressing uh, housing and social deprivation and uh, the threatened sort of two-class polarization of the American city with the middle class driven out. And on the other hand, problems of mobilizing a city's resources and insisting on broad-based inclusionary planning and reviving a retail base of a city and making mass transit work and having truly beautiful places at the heart of cities where people can live and work. In the end, we were caught in this dilemma. One of several finalists was from New York City, the so-called tenant interim lease program, operating in very tough slum neighborhoods it takes buildings that the landlords failed to pay taxes on and therefore the city gained title to becoming a reluctant owner landlord. Well, the idea of the tenant interim lease program is to go in program uh, building by building and advise the tenants, here's how you can set up a council to run your own building and then eventually uh, how you can move towards ownership after a period of three or four or five years when you're ready for it. 
That project is giving people in the meanest urban environments, mostly minority people living well below the poverty line, a chance to manage and then eventually own their own apartments. It's an opening door and opportunity of what our country was supposed to be about in an era when you can't just work real hard by the sweat of your brow and make it very often. Yet our jury also found Portland's application extremely compelling. The 1972 downtown plan and program was first of all uh, 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 succeeded, we noted, by other programs coming in through the years, uh, succeeding cumulatively in turning downtown Portland into one of America's most vibrant uh, downtowns in an era when many downtowns have suffered greatly or become simply great office parks without a lot of human activity in them. Your fusion of top grade political leadership, top grade urban planners, and yes, let us say it's a top grade citizenry cooperating and participating in that process, I think is a model for other cities across the continent, and the jury did too. The physical manifestations the jury noted were, of course, your reclaimed waterfront, historic preservation, uh, your care to preserve low-income housing while introducing medium and higher-scale housing, too, your pioneer courthouse square uh, park, your rapid rail transit, and some of the captivating elements of the street-level statuary and design, which really melted our hearts. But the spirit of the people willing to plan and think forward and respect good leadership and work with planners dazzled us also. And so we felt we had no choice for their equally compelling originality and relevance to where the cities of America stand at this moment in history. We decided that we must divide the 1989 Rudy Brunner Award, both for New York City and for Portland. Indeed, we hope that split in the award Indeed, we hope the split in the award will underscore the emergency need of American cities to follow both these agendas, the social and the planning agendas, uh, forward in our time. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, it gives me great pleasure to present you for the City of Portland with the Rudy Brunner Award for the year. The Rudy Brunner Foundation is not as rich as the Ford Foundation, but it still has some money. There was a $25,000 award, and of course we had to cut it in half since we were recognizing both places. But we figure that half of $25,000 will be more noticed in Portland it's than it will be in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very glad to present you with a, a small check here for $12,500. <laughs> I'd like to ask Earl Blumenauer to come forward now so that we can uh, uh, give some of these other plaques that are available for those who took a real role in the process. Thank you, Neil. There are some cities where they wouldn't even mug you for a check that size. <laughs> but here it will be put to good use. It is my pleasure to spend a moment to acknowledge the other people who are a part of that process. First, there are those who, over the last 20 years, mayors and councils, planning, development, landmarks commission, the design commission, all have played roles in making this award possible. I'd like to start by referring to the people who are much maligned in our society today, the professional consultants, <laughs> comprising about three-fourths of today's audience. <laughs> Consultants past, present, and I'm sure future. <laughs> to make this possible, George McMath, Greg Baldwin, Bing Sheldon, Dick Ivey, Roger Shields, among a number, all assisted in the preparation of the uh, award submittal. Dick Ivey, who is with us today, is being given a Rudy Bruner plaque in recognition of the fact that he was the key person to forge the public-private partnership that funded and prepared, with citizen involvement, Portland's successful downtown plan. 
and we would like to have you come forward if we could at this time. I didn't expect to be such a symbol. <laughs> Thanks Thank very much. You. Thank you. We simply do not have time to acknowledge all of the various elements that went uh, into play, but all you have to do is check back over your city club programs for the last 20 years, and you will find reference to all of the monumental work that really should be acknowledged here in greater detail, but we do want to leave time for our speaker. We would next like to ask Dean Gisvold to come forward. Dean is being awarded a plaque for his role as chair of the Downtown Plan Citizen Advisory Committee, which has set forth the written goals for the downtown development that has taken place over the years. Dean. <laughs> Reference needs to be made to a range of other private developers that helped in the submission uh, to the foundation. Eric Parsons from Cornerstone, Columbia, Pete Mark, Bill Nato, Pat Prendergast, Bob Stoll, and John Russell all helped make this possible. And Bill Nato, Bill, if you'd come forward, is being awarded a special plaque on behalf of the development community for his outstanding efforts, the Downtown Plan Citizen Advisory Committee, the BOMA Downtown Committee, Chair of the Urban Forestry Commission, and Restorer, I understand, of a couple of downtown properties. <laughs> Next, we'd like to turn to another important agency, because it's not just the city. There's a range of important partnerships. Phil Bogue, no stranger to the City Club. If you would come forward, Phil, we would like to make a presentation of a plaque as in your role as TriMet board member. I know it's, sometimes it's hard to keep the role straight, but TriMet in terms of the substantial impact that it has had in the livability of our downtown uh, through and throughout the region. The 5th, 6th Mall and Max have provided the basic framework for the plan and the design quality that these improvements have helped set a high standard for development throughout the metropolitan area. Congratulations. Now, I'm breaking the script that uh, Rod Oheiser uh, uh, has set forward. Rod was the person who was uh, really, more than any single individual, is probably more responsible for what, the way that downtown Portland looks today. And Rod, both for who he is and what he symbolizes for the hundreds of men and women who work as planning professionals and others in the various government agencies, uh, who handled incredibly difficult assignments with uh, patience, with imagination. Uh, Rod, would you come forward for a special recognition here? We will have an award for you. Not only because you prepared, <laughs> and people behind closed doors, not only because you prepared the application, but because of your work on the highly successful transit malls, Pioneer Square, parking anchors, light rail, the linear spine concept, um, waterfront park, the list is endless. Some of your colleagues in the planning bureau gave me a brief outline of points that I might want to add to this. I won't, I will conclude, Rod, by saying that we would also like to join in wishing you happy birthday today. <laughs> Thank you.
gee whiz. After, after that, I think I might say it was great to be at Portland and leave. Uh, actually, one reason I was pleased to be part of being able to bring you that award today was that I remember when Portland wasn't so great. Back in 1970, I interviewed a legal aid attorney in a tiny, cramped, little North Portland office, whom some newspaper guy had told me had, had good insights and maybe someday political ambition. And this guy looked at me the way he looks at you, and he said, this city needs a political upheaval. There's an old, tired crowd in control, and by golly, we're going to have some dramatic changes. And among the ways we're going to change this city, we're going to look at its transportation patterns and do something very different in the future. Well, that interview in July 1970 with Neil Goldschmidt uh, was perfectly timed for me. I was then preparing a book called The Pacific States of America. Uh, I did take the conventional wisdom, I didn't quite believe Goldschmidt at the point, so I started my, my book uh, uh, section on Portland saying, if any West Coast city could be said to have a monopoly on propriety and an anxiousness to keep things as they are, it is Portland, <laughs> a town of quiet old wealth, discreet culture, and cautious politics. But they didn't know you were coming. <laughs> uh, for a moment, uh, this paper trail of one outsider's observations from the early 70s might help to set a little context, though. I did, of course, as a polite outsider, would rhapsodize about your magic view of Mount Hood whenever the mist ra rises, of course, and about your, your Rose Festival. Uh, but then I mentioned the 1970 formation of your Metropolitan Service District and noted, as for the municipal government of Portland itself, it still functions under a comfortable, honest, but quite inefficient commissioned form of Oregon government. Somehow I was smart enough to note a, a few more of the attendant problems, including the fact that the commissioners frequently remained entrenched in their positions for decades, that the system resulted in much log rolling among the commissioners, plus an inability to implement long-term plans and reallocate resources. In the early 70s, it was in fact hard to foresee Portland's incipient dash for brilliance. <laughs> Though I was, I had enough of perception to note that the commissioner's chain of longevity was rudely broken in 1969-70 when death, retirement, and elections opened the way for three aggressive young commissioners to sweep into office. A good muse was also have been sitting on my shoulder as I hunched over that old Selectric in 1971, continued the Portland section with a few words disparaging the then shiny new Hilton Hotel. <laughs> and a couple other high-rises, and I call them megastructures lacking sophistication and creating such fantastic parking demands that vast stretches of Portland are given over to parking lots and garages. You see, things were different. Uh, my account then added that despite some preservation of uh, Victorian commercial buildings and construction of the Lawrence Halpern Fountain, the post-war planners permitted an ugly freeway to slice right along the downtown waterfront, decisively separating water and city. So given all of that, you can imagine what a pleasure it is to be here 16, 18 years later and to have a hand in giving you an award bestowed in part because you brought the waterfront and the other parts of your city back to what they ought to be. But I have a caveat about what comes next. It's simply this. To some degree, Portland seems to have coasted from the immense uh, boost of, uh, of, of brilliance uh, seen in the uh, in the 70s when you got the rail transit planned uh, and so on. I'm well aware that a lot good is happening here. Uh, you have not forsaken your excellent planning tradition. Uh, last year's uh, central city plan I thought was one of the most excellent I've seen uh, out of uh, cities in a long while around the country. You still prize neighborhoods active participation in the civic life of the city. Uh, but I think you have to ask the question, you know, will the 90s keep us or get us on a fresh roll prepared for the new challenges or will we coast? I think we need to be clear. No American city, uh, no American metropolis today assures, uh, can be assured of anything uh, approaching an easy guaranteed future. The swirling tides of national and now international economic competition mean all the old bets are off. Perhaps our country will turn out to do very well in the 90s, in the first years of the next century, but we won't hack it without dramatic improvements in the skill of our workforces, uh, without being prepared to deal with tough trade challenges. The local corollary is that no American city dare assume that its competitors, domestic and foreign, won't be thinking and planning and positioning themselves more smartly 
than you. Which brings me, of course, to the National Civic Index. Why would Portland need a National Civic Index when it's already so great? What is the Civic Index about at all? The simplest analogy has to do with the city's physical infrastructure of roads and bridges and public buildings. If that infrastructure deteriorates or is not well attended, a city becomes decrepit and loses its competitiveness. Starting around 1986, a group of us on the board of the National Civic League began to wrestle with that problem. The National Civic League, uh, formerly the National Municipal League, is America's uh, most venerable uh, citizens organization, begun by Teddy Roosevelt and Louis, Louis Brandeis and Charles Evans Hughes and other reformers in the 1890s when the big issue was corruption and municipal government. Over the years, uh, whether fighting the crooks in City Hall or developing the city manager form of government or advancing codes of government ethics or fostering broad-based citizen participation, the League's bedrock issue has always been the same. Let the people speak, but in ways that assure fairness and equity and excellence in the adventure of community life. But just good government, as we began to think about it, was not enough in the 1980s. Other players were in there in a big, big way. Downtown development districts, activist neighborhoods, transportation management associations, multinational corporations, a long list of new players who sometimes were the ones who made the critical decision rather than a city hall. Uh, one of our National Civic League board members, Scott Fossler, who was then on the, uh, the uh, county council in Montgomery County, Maryland, said that instead of neat government decisions, it appears that everybody is ad hocing it. So with the prompting of the Civic League's new president, John Parr, who m many of you heard this morning speak, we asked ourselves the question, what are the factors uh, we've all seen uh, in many uh, cities and states that restrain and inhibit and even paralyze healthy civic life? And in much the same way, uh, uh, what makes it possible for some communities to really get their act together and to advance with confidence, even in these 1980s of shrinking federal assistance and mounting economic competition. In short, what are the elements of a strong and resilient civic infrastructure to match the sound physical infrastructure that everyone now agrees a successful community needs? What emerged from that inquiry in meetings we held of our volunteer board all across the country in various cities uh, working on this, uh, and then through experimentation in a number of cities, is what we're now calling the National Civic Index. The index, simply put, is a set of 10 principal components, a framework by which communities of all sizes and descriptions can evaluate how well they can solve their own problems. The index is not some silver bullet of municipal success. It's not an artificial numeric measure of community health. Instead, it's a set of challenging questions which will help a community for itself to determine where are we strong, where are we weak, where do our future challenges lie and not just in formal government, but rather in the entire system of governance and all these support groups and all these other actors who are now part of what make a city move forward or not. Okay, let's do a quick tour of these 10 items on the National Civic Index. Appropriately for the National Civic League, the very first item is citizen participation. Informed participating cities are, uh, citizens are the first requirement of any vibrant or strong community. A city without strong citizen participation is not so much a community as a shell that people inhabit. The questions which follow are clear. How well are citizens turning out for local elections? Are there energetic, uh, effective neighborhood and civic groups? Do people have the feeling that their participation makes a difference in what the outcomes are of the debates? Or that they're just pawns, sometimes let in for a hearing, but really just moved around by some power structure? Is the local political process then perceived to be open to all citizens, and how can one encourage citizen participation that leads to consensus rather than to multiple vetoes and a form of civic paralysis? What, does one, what one does not want to have uh, uh, on the citizen participation uh, 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 test is the one I heard from a prominent Arizona official about life in the Phoenix region a couple of years ago. This person had been one of the leading state legislators, and he said to me, quote, the average person here doesn't give a crap about the general interest. They're not willing to participate. Somehow they've opted out, end of quote. The good news, I might add, is that the Phoenix region has been working very hard at that problem and even got an All-America City Award from the National Civic League this spring based on its newfound efforts uh, in citizen participation. 
Next on the index comes community leadership. In today's communities, government, businesses, nonprofits, citizen groups must all be in on the Leadership Act. The era of the buccaneer, lone ranger leader is over. As one obser observer puts it, leadership increasingly resides in the many rather than the few, in joint rather than individual endeavors, and in the empowerment rather than the control of others. Mayor Daley would not have been comfortable with this new form of leadership. <laughs> Matter of fact, we have a mayor in Washington, D.C., Marion Barry, who's not comfortable with it either, and he's <laughs> learning the limits. Someone asks, do community leaders in fact represent and speak for the diverse needs of their community? Is the leadership results-oriented? Is it risk-taking? Do the leaders communicate and work together? Are they willing to share power and take a long-term view? Do they develop new leadership? In other words, work at the next at the farm club. Uh, in a crisis, do they have a forum for convening and taking action? Third is government performance. Is the local government professional and competent? Uh, is it open and accountable? Is it free of corruption? Do citizens feel access to public services is influenced by favoritism, who you know, or whether they've given money in the last campaign? Do some neighborhoods get special treatment, do others get short shrift? And in a day of uh, revenue shortages with economic development issues pretty high on people's agendas, is the local government entrepreneurial? Uh, looking for ways to spend more money, uh, less money, or raise it more effectively and fairly? Is the government open, for instance, uh, to new methods of service delivery? Would it be willing to contract with neighborhood organizations if it made sense uh, and was economical for park maintenance or uh, elderly care or what have you? I understand that your voters in the last 30 years have rejected a strong mayor form of government, a city manager form, and city-county consolidation. Makes it sound like a very negative city. Uh, a non-stop list of rejections, uh, probably because you didn't see overwhelming merit in any of them. But still, I don't see how you avoid the problems of the efficiency and responsiveness of the commissioner form that I was already hearing moans and groans about 20 years ago. Perhaps one outcome of your civic index effort could be a couple of years of serious study of your form of government. An outsider does get the impression that Portland's advances in design and planning and social inclusiveness have been despite rather than because of the commissioner form. How one in this day and age gets along without a fairly strong executive, for example, remains a bit of a mystery to me. Next on the civic index comes volunteerism and philanthropy. In times of shrunken public uh, resources, citizens are faced with giving more of their own time and money and in-kind services to help the community. So one asks, is there a healthy climate for volunteerism and giving? Uh, has a community considered a device like Metro Denver Gives, setting target goals of per capita volunteer hours and average contributions per person within the community? Uh, is there an organized corporate giving program? Is there a strong community foundation? Do local foundations exercise rigorous needs assessment and break from uh, uh, familiar giving patterns by sometimes making contributions to very promising but unproven new charities? Uh, I did mention a moment ago America's Community Foundations. I think there are many cities becoming proactive, not just receiving grant applications, but thinking, how do we make grants that will help this community look at new uh, and unmet needs? Uh, dozens of community foundations are working to improve uh, underperforming local schools. A couple of months ago, I looked at the New Hampshire Charitable Fund, statewide foundation. It's supporting such diverse causes as advocacy for abused children, Alliance for More Effective Schools, Affordable Housing, and the preservation of tens of thousands of imperiled North uh, Country uh, forest lands. New frontiers of philanthropy may be more critical to American society with its private and its non-government way of operating than to any other major world society. We do well to keep recalling the words in Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from the Birmingham City Jail, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny, whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. Intergroup relations come next on the civic index list. America was built on its diversity of peoples from all over the globe. And we have not stopped that unusual march through history. Our civilization stands out among those of the world for its multi-ethnic, multi-racial composition. Our ability to capitalize on our diversity and not be torn about, apart by it may be critical to whether we can succeed in the next century. 
Today, American communities are becoming rapidly uh, more ethnically and racially diverse. It's inevitable that a healthy civic infrastructure demands sound, well-tended relations ranging all the way from conflict management skills to celebration of the diverse ethnic uh, and uh, uh, national cultures and heritages in our midst. The National Civic Index asks, does the community have programs to stimulate communication among its diverse populations? Are minorities integrated into community-wide activities? Is the school system responding well to increased diversity? Does the community take its intergroup relations seriously enough to keep a devoting attention to it as a priority? I've been spending some time this week in Seattle preparing uh, for the Seattle Times a special report on the present and more particularly the future state of the central Puget Sound region. Why they let a journalist who doesn't work on their staff and to do that I don't know but at any rate I plan to have some fun with it. A lot of the focus in that study is on land use how to make provision for uh, the Boeing and high-tech driven waves of population growth that are engulfing the Puget Sound region even while one tries at the same moment to preserve the physical exquisite evergreen watered natural environment. There's a lot of jealousy in Seattle I might add about Oregon's land use plan. Fifteen years uh, late there's ther serious thought in Washington State about state mandated uh, land use uh, guidelines. But I mention Seattle particularly now because of the question of minority group relations of both these northwestern cities. Both of them have statistically smaller minority communities by a long way than the Detroits and the Newarks and the Los Angeleses and the El Pasos of America. Uh, yet they have minority communities with continuing deep social and economic uh, problems. Problems reflected uh, even in drug-related gang warfare creeping up the Pacific Coast. The fascinating question this poses for me is simply, can the Pacific Northwest cities set models of working constructively with troubled minority communities? Uh, addressing problems of family disillusion and troubled lives of young kids and education and linking minorities to the mainstream economy. I hope so, for if the greater society can't address this problem effectively in this region, in the Pacific Northwest, in these two very progressive and inventive cities, although I know yours is the most progressive and inventive, but still. <laughs> in this general region of America, we can't address it here, then where can we address it well? Uh, and if you're successful at it, then there are two spin-offs. First, a more competent, employable, less troubled population, which means great economic and social benefit for you for the long term. And second, setting a model uh, for America of how this job can be done. Let me go back to the rest of the civic index. We have an item on civic education. I'm glad it's there. Uh, not just because uh, uh, one can think, oh goodness, we need to teach people to be civic and maybe have some high school civics courses that focus on the mechanics of government, but really, how does a community think about uh, coaxing into and making, making young people really part of the civic life of their community so they learn about that at an early uh, age? Uh, the lessons of full civic life must be part of our emotions, according to an article written in the National Civic Review. They must dwell in our heart and at times be something we feel strongly but can't explain completely. The lessons of civic life must include an attachment to justice, a willingness to serve uh, beyond self-interest, an openness to all those who share the ranks of citizen, and a perspective that reaches beyond the generation uh, living to those unborn. So when asked, does the public school system offer a quality civics curriculum? Do the school systems encourage youth to be involved in community service, or even require it in some places? Do the public and the private and the nonprofit sectors cooperate in trying to promote civic values within the community? Next is community information sharing. How does and how can the citizenry learn about the critical issues that stand in front of the city and the region? How does one set the context for discussion and debate? The issue is a critical one. If you don't have comprehensive and accurate information, a community can be disastrously inhibited in its capacity to make some balanced judge, uh, judgments and to head off contentious disputes. We tend to think first of the media and appropriately. A spirited, forthright, honest, civically minded press that knows it is both the observer and critic of and part of the community is an enormous asset anywhere. We also need, sometimes in some cities less often enjoy, 
radio and television stations that communicate beyond the sensational issue and beyond the list of criminals of the day a commitment to the future of the city and coverage and commentary that takes the future of the community seriously. Delighted to hear from Earl Blumenauer that there's some possibility of some very sensitive uh, television coverage of what the civic uh, index process will be doing. That would be a great breakthrough. But information sharing can happen in other ways uh, other than press or radio to, or TV. It can happen through schools and universities, very clearly or civic and religious institutions. In some American cities, the best way to carry a message to the black community is through the black churches. The methods of information uh, and how it should be provided are multiple, but the need is singular to make democracies and uh, therefore our communities work well. Capacity for cooperation and consensus building, number eight on the civic index. How in today's tangentious society do we get the vital partners, private business, city and county governments, nonprofits, neighborhood groups, to sit down and identify some common goals? We live in a profoundly individualistic culture marked by ferocious hyper-specialization. To create consensus, the common ground that Jesse Jackson kept talking about in last year's campaign, we need a variety of special processes to bring the various camps together. Mediation negotiated investment strategies, community-based working groups. The Civic Index appropriately asks whether leaders from all the sectors have forums or methods of getting together to discuss common concerns. What organizations have emerged to link public and private and nonprofit sectors? How can the consensus building machinery be strengthened? So the contentious issues, for example, have a chance for discussion and resolution among caring individuals rather than being fought out in the press day by day with more and more spectacular headlines, more heat and less understanding. We come next, and I say that, by the way, having spent most of my life working with the press, we like those hot debates and fights, but they sometimes paralyze the city. Occasionally you need them, however, first to bring the issues up to the surface. We come next to a community's capacity for strategic long-term planning. I've been astounded by the number of communities coast to coast that have been trying over the course of the 80s to use strategic planning, to think carefully about their long-term economic and social prospects, and devise strategies to assure a safer and more productive future. We have begun to learn what good long-range strategic city plans are all about, that they must help us pinpoint those major trends that will affect a community's physical form and its health, assure the future of neighborhoods and landmarks, find ways to use the city's regulatory powers and the, the money it spends on capital improvements and all sorts of initiatives to get the kind of redevelopment and new development that you really want to have in your city, not someone else's idea of it, and to act strategically to improve the community's competitiveness in the marketplace for investment, employment, growth. Many communities are starting to use the word vision to describe their long-term planning process in effect visualizing and articulating the kind of city that the residents would like to have for themselves in the future. Last on the Civic Index is regional or inter-community cooperation. Cutbacks in federal funds and the fierce economic competition between regions are two factors driving neighboring cities and towns and counties across this country to look for new avenues of cooperation and avoiding an image of senseless combativeness. Indeed, it's almost preposterous to suggest that we can find sufficient answers within a single city or suburb for most of the critical problems we now face. You tell me, within the borders of Portland alone, can you solve your economic development problems, your human resource problems, water quality, solid waste, homelessness? I could go on and on. It's just impossible. The metropolitan scene is the realistic scene. For you in Portland, that quickly translates into the question of how the city of Portland and Metro and TriMet and the port can work together. Everywhere in America it poses the issues. Are local governments trying to work together on shared problems? Are there workable ways to address region-wide problems or policy disputes? Are there too many or too few agencies working on the regional agendas? What's the accountability and the effectiveness of those uh, uh, institutions? So those are the elements of the National Civic Index. You would ask, what is the process by which a community undertakes it? And all you need to do is ask Earl Blumenauer, and he'll give you a two-hour description of how easy it is. And of course, a great number of you are doing it today. I think, in general principles, the answer is in a manner and a style that fits the situations and the customs and the politics of that place. From the cities that have tried the exercise, the message I hear most clearly is get a broad and representative group of people involved, find out the groups who are the real stakeholders in the community's future, involve them all, and almost everything else flows from that. 
Charlotte, North Carolina is now finishing up the civic index process, and the people behind it are a little bit less than ecstatic. They are sh barely short of ecstatic about the results. In the words of Betty Chafin Rash, the civic leader who sparked it there, it's gone extremely well. We assembled a remarkably diverse group of people who now feel they know the community, its needs, its assets, its strengths far better than they did before. Their awareness is greatly heightened. But it wasn't easy, she explains. It took a lot of extra work, for example, to get a representative number of blacks and blue collar people onto the civic index uh, committee. The organizers went to members of the city council says, give us names of people who are not on the usual civic junkie suspect list. We want others. <laughs> uh, to get balance, they looked at a geographic spread among neighborhoods and professions and differing backgrounds and different political uh, philosophies. Elected and appointed officials themselves were in on the mix, but they weren't dominant. It took months, and it was the hardest part of the process, Betty Rash says, but we came out with a remarkably balanced cross cut. We knew it was good, she said, when some people said we didn't have enough traditional leaders and the other people said we were too close to the establishment. Uh, in all of this, a, kind, a special kind of interpersonal and cross-community dynamic emerges. Chris Gates, the National Civic League, who's helped with several of the index effort, believes that when you empower a diverse group of of community stakeholders and make sure they are representative and not coming in with fixed agendas, uh, and then you make sure the process is as open as possible, it almost never turns out poorly. A legitimately open process is imperative. Invariably, some people will come in suspicion, in suspicious, and they'll be saying, what's the agenda? Why was this thing pulled, pulled together? Uh, and Chris Gates explains, only the experience of having this blank slate in front of them and freedom to go to any conclusions they like gets people to be comfortable with it. No, it's not a business agenda or it's not a, a city hall agenda or anyone else's. Uh, and to learn, you can say anything you like to anybody who's in there, even to a city manager or to a department head uh, or to a major businessman. The freedom of debate. Uh, actually, this turns out to be a gold mine for elected officials because they hear things more frankly than they never, normally do uh, otherwise. But it can be a bumpy process. Uh, participants relate there are inevitably moments of despair when people wonder, why the hell are we into this? Because self-evaluation is always frustrating and tough. The preferred method seems to be have, have, these, uh, have a separate to full session on each one of the major elements of the uh, uh, civic index. One obviously needs to prepare well for each of those sessions. What are the results of an index process? What are the products? Pretty exciting, I think. First of all, there's this bunch of people, city officials included, who know the community at a level of depth and variety that they never did before. A new unique context is created for dealing with all manner of past, of, of present and uh, future community problems. Second, there ought to be a written report to the community. What are the major things that are found? Third, there may be need to have a subgroup that concentrates uh, on some of the recommendations that should be candidates for early implementation. Uh, some of the ideas will have to do with bolstering existing institutions. Others will have to do with opening new channels of dialogue. In Charlotte, they're thinking possibly of copying the Minneapolis-St. Paul Citizens League to have an ongoing citizen monitoring, encouraging, cheering, correcting group of citizens on major uh, civic uh, endeavors. If the stakeholder analysis has been done correctly in the first place, the people who worked on the index become a facilitating core themselves, a coalition of highly diverse types of people capable of instant and frank communication, pick up the phone, I know those people, I've dealt with them, connected to the grassroots and the power structure alike, uniquely qualified to press to get things done in their community. So my bet is that Portlanders out of this process will not just be able to build on your city's luminous history of good planning and citizen participation. You should also be able to put uh, some of your serious problems from black poverty to school dropouts to homelessness to lack of regional cohesion in a more coherent context to recognize new wellsprings of civic talent from your emerging yuppie class to the blue collar neighborhoods. In short, to get yourself ready and early, well, effectively, for a new generation of challenges to your economy, your form of government, your region, and the health and cohesiveness of your society. No one knows the end of a road that a civic index process leads you toward. Yet I think it represents the best new road map maybe the most important breakthrough in how we work consciously on improving the process of community governance that Americans have had a long while. So the Portland and the City Club and all of you here today are to be congratulated for embarking on this adventure. Uh, my bet is uh, that uh, uh, if you follow through with it, and I assume you will, uh, that you will have uh, some fascinating rewards from it. 
in the years ahead. I'm very pleased to have been with you today. Thank you. I want to thank Neil for that excellent presentation. Uh, and speaking of the Civic Index, I, I think that the group that's here uh, as participants uh, shows the interest that Portlanders have in their future in their community. I'm told that more than 275 people have taken part in this opening session today, and you are to be congratulated. We are now moving on to the question part of our program. Uh, we are, have a mic that's just been placed in the center of the room. If you are shy and wish to uh, propose a written question, you will find forms on your table. We give the uh, option of, or the uh, precedence to those that have the nerve to stand up in front of us and ask their questions rather than to written uh, questions. Our first questioner today is a city club member and on his off time is also a city commissioner, Earl Blumenauer. Earl. Thank you, Mr. President. Neil, you referenced in the course of your remarks some of the comparisons between Portland and Seattle by reason of proximity, history, business, and just the old competitive instincts. We're real interested in that here in our community. Since you've been there over the course of the last week uh, b involved with that project, I wondered if you might be able to share a sense of how the two communities are measuring up to these challenges that you're talking about. My friend Earl always asks easy questions. That's a complex one. Uh, I think there is a feeling in Seattle that Portland is more in charge of its future and that Seattle needs to learn something from you. Uh, I think especially since they're now uh, getting worried about land use more and more, they look down to you and see uh, what they consider a success model. But they figure they're very much like you. You know, you're both, you're both part of Ecotopia. Uh, uh, there's going to be a new magazine that uh, David Brewster, who's publisher of the Weekly in Seattle, has been working on, which will be called New West, and will look at British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon, and try to see how these three, this one province and two states, are working on their future. And I think that should be a very interesting dialogue, opening of dialogue, uh, David says it is not to show that Seattle is the center of things, even if they publish it there. Uh, but he wants to have major contributors, both from uh, uh, Vancouver and, and here as well. Uh, I touched on the minority question earlier, but I, I'd, I think I'd like to come back again on the, 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 the questions of a land use. Certainly in transportation, there's also a feeling that your rapid rail indicates a getting hold of a problem far earlier in Seattle. Seattle seems to be filled with a lot of very bright and very civic people, but they sort of get right up to it, but they can't quite do it a lot of the time. Uh, and maybe that's a problem that's in our society and growing these days of uh, lots of people with lots of ideas, but also too many checkmates around. And ways to move to action, I think, should be part of your civic index uh, 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 process. In land use, uh, we had a no I've been having, I'm doing all day long about eight or nine interviews a day all this week up in Seattle until I broke to come here. Uh, and uh, there's some proposals there uh, to do some massive open space purchases with this huge wave of population coming in. Uh, took a, a helicopter ride up over the Puget Sound region and then the east side as they put it and up north towards Snohomish County and Everett and then back down around the SeaTac airport the other day. You see vast areas that are just gorgeous environmentally now, but pieces of development, some of it pretty lousy looking, beginning to creep in. King County is trying to zone a lot of it out, but developer pressure has a way of defeating zoning in time. Uh, so there's more talk now of some massive land purchases, as they did with farmlands a few years ago, buying development rights to the farmlands, to at least assure, at a minimum, that you have green spaces between towns and they don't just, you know, eventually merge into one, you know, New Jersey in the Northwest. Uh, and one person came up with an idea which I thought was absolutely fascinating. He said, as you, as you, as you buy chunks of the land, you shouldn't promise to keep 100% of it in open space. You should promise to keep maybe 90% of it in open space. And you should plan, as future population pressures oblige you to, to make 
a 10% a place for a dense village out there on the urban periphery. Uh, a town that would be well planned, a town that would not have a lot of spread or sprawl to it, a town that would be tremendously desirable to live in given what its environs would be out in these green areas. Uh, and I thought that was a very interesting idea because you might be able eventually to pay back the cost of the land you bought at farm value with the little piece of land you sell back at high, high zoning land value. Uh, and in effect, you hand a developer an environmental impact statement or seal of approval uh, with the purchase of parts of that. And also the public sector could control for the highest quality, uh, keeping the, count, the development dense, maybe be more appropriate, increasingly appropriate in years ahead as we have more and more elderly that would like uh, denser forms of housing, but I would hope also full communities. And just how it would be worked out, I don't know. One could certainly do that kind of purchase uh, here in Oregon, for instance, if you feel that the pressures on your urban growth boundary are eventually going to be too much to handle and developers are going to find ways to get incursion into it, maybe the, 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 the thing to do is to do some strategic purchases as a state early on and maybe hold some of them 10, 20, or 30 years. But then you'd have an opportunity then to have urban development that doesn't fill you up you know, right along the floor of all your valleys and, and, and take away this incredible natural resource of the beauty of the, uh, of the evergreen Northwest. So uh, I think some uh, new inventive thinking uh, may come. And if I got that good piece of uh, information uh, or idea out of a Seattle interview, or maybe I brought half a worthwhile thing south this morning. Uh, <clears throat> Ned Luck, City Club member. Neil, as we look at the 10 components of the Civic Index and develop our vision, how do we keep our vision in focus by at the same time addressing how we're going to pay for it? I think that the, that the, the I mean, it's obviously tough, but that if you are, if you're forming a vision that is coherent and comes from the people and is well thought out, then the public willingness to pay for it is eventually there. And that one of the great problems in the society is a small bunch of very bright people coming up with a great idea or a set of ideas which they have yet to get the public to buy into and the public therefore says no. Now look, that's an easy answer. I know it's harder. <laughs> I know it's very tough. Uh, I mean, if we had to go back to a fresh vote of the people on, on a list of all the services the government now provides each year and ask them to check continue or discontinue, a lot of very fine and essential government programs would be discontinued. But I do think that a good, a, a good, a good civic index uh, process uh, is part of building, not only in terms of the people that are involved, but what should be the planning or the inspiration out of that to public contact and public debate broadly in the society about what you face. So that eventually uh, you create, you help to create a citizenry that is willing to do those things that make sense collectively uh, and pay for them. But I also think that the, the, the idea these days must also be in part, how do we do things more economically? And if you can get the economic element introduced uh, as well as the uh, visionary one in terms of nice things to do, then you have a broader base uh, possibly. Brilliant. Coraline Craft, City Club member. Since you've just delivered a number of accolades about us, I think our egos can take the answer to this question. What do you see as our most significant shortcoming? Hmm. Oh, I did, I, I did note a, 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 a shortcoming on the social side, but that's a, that's a shortcoming of most American cities and communities today with, with uh, minorities. The worst problems are usually with, uh, with black communities, but they exist in other minority communities too. Uh, that's where I think that American society as a whole is underinvesting in people and not understanding how critical they are to our future uh, in the world. And I don't think that, that, that this area, this state, or this city is immune from that. Uh, because the capacity of a community to look at the people who li live there now and look at its kids and realize their tomorrow's future and look and see whether your schools are performing at a high and at a competitive level uh, and whether there's real sense of competition and, uh, and uh, high level of, uh, 
of morale within the school systems uh, and whether families are getting, being given assistance and so on is where it's going to be for the future. And I'll admit I'll say this in almost any city, and I said earlier I thought it might be easier here in a way uh, than others in relationship to minorities, which will probably apply also to all lower income people. But I, I can imagine, I don't think it's hard to imagine times in the next century uh, when only communities that, the, 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 that if you have a community with a large dependent population, it is a, a tremendous uh, a downward uh, anchor. Uh, and that uh, we have now a very affluent society in this country, and most of our metropolitan areas have the people and the talent to overcome most of those problems. They're not mysteries. We know that families given counseling uh, all the way from prevention of abuse from kids when they're very young or prenatal care up through high schools and good career counseling makes a huge difference. And that creates a stronger tax bank public. Uh, it reduces the, the, the burden on the criminal justice system. Uh, it prevents teenage pregnancies, premature and all that kind of thing, and you create a stronger human society. And I think that's, that's the problem basically of American society, but if you break it down to within communities, it's the communities that understand that, because the answer is not going to come from a federal government set of programs, it's going to come from will within the community to work on those problems and solve them. And I think that's the counterpart uh, to the a, a kind of progress you need to be sort of a counterpart to what you've done on the physical side in the last few years. I hope you will join me in thanking Mr. Pierce. I hate to cut off the questions, but we are at the end of our time. Thank you all for attending, and we are adjourned. <laughs>